Um, we've got now Gary Rensberg. Gary's friend of the library, friend of many of us. Uh, excited to hear what he's got to say about the book of Genesis as a product of the United Monarchy. Fresh in from Rutgers. Thank you for being here. How's that? Great. Thank you, Mark. It is a great pleasure to be here at the Lanier Theological Library. Thank you for your warm hospitality. Uh, and to Charles and the rest of the staff, this is my third visit to Lanier. So I now qualify to be called in Hebrew a Ben Bayat, which means literally a son of the home, uh, because I do feel very much at home every time uh, I'm here. Um, The year is 1593, CE that is, not BCE. We will get to the BCE period soon enough, but for now let us stay with 1593 CE. The scene is a tavern in London. The following seven men are seated around a table. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Johnson, Dunn, Spencer, Bacon, and Raleigh. If the movie Shakespeare in Love helps you imagine the scene, great. There on the spot, these seven men create modern English literature. What led to this moment in time in 1593 when in my little fantasy world, these seven individuals launched the great enterprise known as modern English literature? Let us review the events of the previous century. In 1476, William Caxton brought the first printing press to England, allowing for the easier production of books and the spread of literacy. In the 1500s, the Renaissance reached England, and with it, the rediscovery of the classics of Greece and Rome. The study of biblical Hebrew also flourished, especially with the establishment of the Regis Professorships of Hebrew at Oxford and Cambridge under the auspices of Henry VIII, positions which continue down to the present day. In 1588, the English defeated the Spanish Armada, and with that event, England became the dominant political and military force in Europe. It truly was an age of glory for England. Fifteen years before our seven men are sitting in the London Tavern, Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe, claiming lands on distant shores for England, including present-day Northern California and Oregon. All of this created a new England. And ruling over it all was Elizabeth I, whose long and successful reign fostered the arts. The queen herself, in fact, could read or speak six languages, including classical Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Fun fact, Elizabeth's Hebrew tutor was Antoine Chevalier, who later would serve as Regis Professor of Hebrew in Cambridge. Her fellow student was Thomas Baudley, who would go on to found the library of the University of Oxford, which still bears his name. The connection between political power and the flowering of the arts is a well-established one in world history. Classical Greece, Imperial Rome, Medieval Spain, 17th century Holland, Napoleonic France, England's second go-round under Queen Victoria, and 20th century America. The height of these countries' political and military power corresponds to the height of their artistic, creative endeavors. A new religion was a swirl in England. Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, had broken with the church in Rome and had established the new Church of England. The new church became even more firmly established under his daughter Elizabeth, whose anti-Catholic stance characterized her reign. Within a year of ascending the throne, she oversaw the act of uniformity, requiring the use of the Protestant Book of Common Prayer. She removed all the Catholics from her privy council, and she established herself as the supreme governor of the Church of England. Against the backdrop of all this political, military, and religious activity stands an important event in 1576. James Burbage built England's first theater. This single act spawned the transition of plays from relatively silly little things produced at fairs or on the street to serious theatrical presentations of lasting import, making Shakespeare possible. And thus was invented modern English literature during the reign of Elizabeth I, or in my imaginary world, 
by the seven men, note the good biblical number, seated in a London tavern in 1593 during the heyday of Her Majesty's rule. John Dryden, writing only a century later, would refer to these writers as, quote, that great race of men who lived before the flood, unquote, employing quite felicitously a well-known biblical topos. Now, what does all of this have to do with the Bible? The comparisons with Jerusalem in the 10th century BCE are striking. There was a new polity in Israel, a monarchy, which traditionally had not been a feature of the society. In fact, quite the contrary, since according to normative Israelite theology, only God could be king, and any human king was a compromise of that tenet. For the first time, power was concentrated in a single place, Jerusalem. In contrast to traditional Israelite society, formed by a loose confederation of 12 tribes, sharing many beliefs and customs, especially the worship of one God, but otherwise retaining autonomy from one another. The establishment of a monarchy in Jerusalem brought about a new stage of social development as Israel shifted from a tribal, pastoral, and village lifestyle to a new urbanism. These major changes did not occur without opposition. The Bible records a resistance to the new monarchic system, first in the Book of Kings and then most forcefully in 1 Samuel 8 through the voice of the prophet Samuel. But the liberals of the day, if we can call them that, won out and Israel moved to a monarchy, first in the person of Saul, a transitionary figure, and then in complete fashion under David and Solomon, by which point human kingship was a fate accompli. When David died, there was a question as to who would uh, succeed him, but no one doubted that it would be one of his sons. So quickly had kingship taken hold in Israel. Similarly, when Solomon died, the northern tribes expressed their discontent, but there was no turning back to an earlier system of governance. Thus, when the northern tribes refused to follow Rehoboam, son of Solomon, grandson of David, their only choice was to set up a rival kingdom with a parallel royal dynasty established by Jeroboam, from the tribe of Ephraim. There was also a new religious development during the 10th century BCE. Until this point, the Ark of the Covenant, the centerpiece of the Israelite cult, had been housed in the tabernacle, a tent structure, in the village of Shiloh in the territory of Ephraim. David brought the Ark to Jerusalem amidst great ceremony, and a generation later, Solomon built the temple to, build, to house the Ark. The temple, a structure of stone, was something totally alien to Israelite religious life. Temples of stone were features of urban life, indeed of the Canaanites. The Israelites were traditionalists with a tent-like tabernacle, portable during their wandering period, then housed in a smallish village, but by no means to be replaced by the urban wonder. In fact, the temple was so foreign to Israelite lifestyle that Solomon needed to import Phoenician architects and builders to undertake the project. The very notion of Jerusalem as the religious and administrative capital of the nation was altogether new and striking. After all, it, Jerusalem had not been an Israelite city until this point. The traditional capital was Shechem. It was the city where representatives of the 12 tribes would gather when necessary, as we see in Joshua 24, for example. Jerusalem, by contrast, had been an independent city-state of the Jebusites, but that was exactly the point. Since it had not belonged to any of the 12 tribes, and since David sought to diminish the influence of the tribes, the choice of Jerusalem was intentional. It would serve him well as the capital of the new political entity. Americans will compare the selection of Washington, D.C., belonging to, to no state, and parallel examples include Canberra, Australia, and Brasilia, Brazil. David built an international empire, first by quashing the Philistine threat and gaining control of remaining Canaanite pockets within the ideal boundaries of Israel, and then by conquering Moab and Ammon to the east, Edom to the southeast, and as we've just heard from Lawson Younger, Aram to the northeast, all the while securing good relations with the Phoenicians to the northwest via treaty alliance. The result was an empire stretching from the Sinai Desert in the southwest to the Euphrates River in the far northeast, or at least according to the biblical account. 
to return to religious issues. Something even more shocking occurred during David's reign. The new king in Jerusalem, David, allowed the former Canaanite or Jebusite high priest of the city to remain in that position, even though the deity now worshipped there was Yahweh. Which is to say, numerous scholars, myself included, believe that Sadok, Zadok, was the former king and high priest of Jerusalem, of Jebusite Jerusalem. When David conquered the city, he stripped Sadok of his civil authority as king of the city, but he permitted him to retain his religious authority as high priest over the cult of the city, again, one now devoted to the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. How to get the people to go along with all these major drastic changes of the 10th century? Monarchy, an international empire, the centrality of Jerusalem, Zadok as priest. The answer is, write a national epic incorporating all of the earlier traditions back to Abraham and embed into that narrative anticipations of, of the present. That is to say, there is a social, religious, and indeed political message in the book of Genesis. Or in other words, tell the story about the past, but reflect upon the present. This was the major accomplishment of the anonymous authors in Jerusalem who created the book of Genesis to be dated, in my opinion, to the 10th century BCE. Let us turn to some specific examples in defense of my hypothesis. The first is God's promise to Abraham that kings shall stem from him and from Sarah in Genesis chapter 17. Through these passages, our author instructs the reader, do not oppose kingship, it is God's will. Second, the boundaries of the land of Canaan promised to Abraham in Genesis 15 from the river of Egypt, most likely this refers to the Wadi El Arish, to the Euphrates River match the extent of the Davidic Solomonic Empire. Uh, at an earlier time, an Israelite could only have laughed at such an idea of an empire this size, for Israel was a very minor player in the geopolitics of the 12th and 11th centuries. And after the death of Solomon, the empire collapsed, never again to be realized. The third item is the emphasis placed on Judah in the book of Genesis, especially Jacob's deathbed words to his fourth son in Genesis chapter 49. The dying patriarch describes Judah in royal terms. His brothers shall bow down to him and tribute shall come to him. In addition, Judah is the most noble of the brothers in the Joseph story. It is his long speech in Genesis 44 that brings Joseph to tears to reveal himself to his brothers. These three items converge to demonstrate that the book of Genesis, or at least its greatest part, derives from the 10th century. The anonymous author responsible for this masterpiece of literature told the story of Israel's patriarchs, but that story is at all times refracted through the prism of the present. God approves kingship, which is to reside within the tribe of Judah, and the boundaries of the realm were preordained in hoary antiquity. Or to put this in other terms, the story of the patriarchs is narrated, but the shadow of David and Solomon is evident throughout. This technique is well known in world literature. The best example from our country is Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which narrates the past, specifically the Salem witch trials of late 17th century Massachusetts, but echoes the present with specific reference to the McCarthyism of the 1950s of which Miller himself was a victim. Or to take an example from film, the movie MASH, released in 1969, tells the story of American troops during the Korean War, but in essence it is about another land war in Asia, the one still raging at that time, the one in Vietnam. Finally, let us recall that Shakespeare's histories tell the lives of earlier kings, but at the same time are informed by the English monarchy of his own day, illustrated best, perhaps, by Richard II. Having established the main point about Genesis and its connection to the Jerusalem court of Kings David and Solomon, let us look at additional details in the text that support our hypothesis. As noted, David establishes rule over the small kingdoms to the east. 
the author of Genesis reflects this by um, relating the ancestors of these nations to the family of Abraham. Moab and Ammon are descended from Abraham's nephew Lot, while Edom is descended from Abraham's grandson Esau. In addition, note that Isaac's blessing to Esau in Genesis 27 foretells a time when Esau, that is to say Edom, will throw off the yoke of his brother, that is to say Israel. Exactly as 1 Kings 11 records in detail how Edom rebelled against Solomon towards the end of his reign. Jerusalem is alluded to in the book of Genesis in several places. Consider Genesis 14, 18 with our attention drawn to Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, short for Jerusalem. This episode includes the important detail that Abram tithes to Melchizedek. The message for someone in 10th century BCE Israel is clear. Do not object to tithing to the new Canaanite king priest who supervises the cult in Jerusalem, namely Zadok, for it is something that Father Abraham did in the distant past already to Melchizedek. And note that the two names of these two figures include the same root, Tzadi Dalat Kof, Tzadak, to be righteous, thereby further solidifying the connection. A more subtle reference to Jerusalem occurs in Genesis 22 in the famous story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Here we encounter the earliest reference in the Bible to the expression Har Adonai, the Mount of the Lord, which in every other attestation refers unambiguously to Jerusalem or Mount Zion. Later Jewish tradition would make this explicit, claiming that Mount Moriah is the spot on which the temple was built. The author of Genesis 22 makes the same point, but much more subtly. Moreover, while Abraham builds altars in a variety of locations throughout the narrative, only here in Genesis 22 does he sacrifice. The point could not be clearer. The ram caught in the thicket would be but the first of countless rams sacrificed on that spot. The third allusion to Jerusalem in Genesis is the mention of the Gihon Spring in Genesis 2 as one of the rivers of Eden. This is the name of the large spring in Jerusalem, as Jane discussed earlier, the city's largest water source by far, whose presence makes life in that place possible. We must, of course, disregard the geographical impossibility of the confluence of the Tigris, Euphrates, and the Gihon, but that is beside the point. We are dealing here with the transfiguration of a myth, which has the great life-giving water sources of the world flowing together, including the main water source of Jerusalem. The author of Genesis, faced with a people unaccustomed to ascribing any special quality to the city, embedded into his narrative these passages, the Melchizedek episode, the reference to the Mount of the Lord, and the mention of the Gihon, in order to demonstrate the centrality of Jerusalem. A dominant theme in Genesis perceived by everyone who reads that book is the motif of the younger son. This is Lawson Younger's favorite part of the Bible. What lies behind this repeated motif? To my mind, these stories are a reflection of David as the youngest son of Jesse and of Solomon as the youngest son of David. The author wishes us to know God indeed favors the younger or the youngest son. Yet another theme that dominates Genesis is fraternal strife. Once more, we can point to the present conditions of 10th century BCE as the background for this motif. In fact, in a rather severe way, because Absalom kills Amnon and Solomon arranges for the killing of Adonijah. Moreover, the familiar tale of Cain and Abel now comes into greater focus, for a very specific lexical item connects this story uh, to the book of Samuel. Note that Cain kills Abel Basadeh in the field. The same word occurs as occurs in the mouth of the wise woman of Tekoa in her elusive account to Absalom's slaying of Amnon. All of this evidence, to my mind, demonstrates that the book of Genesis is a product of the 10th century Jerusalem. The author or authors narrate the past, but the composition reflects the present. William Faulkner was absolutely correct. The past is never dead. It's not even past. I began this talk with my imagined London tavern scene. Let me conclude accordingly with something real. 
namely the reality of what transpired in Concord, Massachusetts during the 19th century. Living in the same small village were Emerson Thoreau, Hawthorne Channing, Bronson Alcott, and his more famous daughter, Louisa May, the core individuals of the transcendentalist movement and their fellow literary travelers. Living nearby in other towns or in Boston proper were Fuller, Peabody, and Longfellow, lifelong friend of Hawthorne. The lives of these individuals reached others, including Melville, Whitman, Greeley, and Mann. Note that Melville dedicated Moby Dick to Hawthorne, while Horace Mann was Hawthorne's brother-in-law. Without diminishing the work and influence of others, one may rightly claim that this remarkable group of writers created American literature during the middle of the 19th century. In fact, one may make an even greater claim they created America. Consider, for example, Emerson's poem, Conquered Him, and Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, with their evocations of the Revolutionary War. What led to this moment in time in the middle of the 19th century, which allowed for this circle of people to create the great enterprise known as American literature? Simply stated, the United States was coming of age, and with this advance came its new national literature centered in Concord, Massachusetts. Due to the anonymous nature of ancient Israelite literature and Near Eastern literature more generally, we cannot know the names of the individuals responsible for the creation of the book of Genesis. But in some way, I like to imagine a circle of individuals akin to our friends in a London tavern or to the transcendentalists and their literary heirs in 19th century Concord. And these individuals during the 10th century BCE collectively created the national literature at the heart of ancient Israel. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.